Very fortuitous. My power just came on two minutes ago. Yeah, how are you guys holding up there? What part of Texas are you in? C Central Texas, just between Fort Hood and Austin. Your power just came on and the OCI call was your priority? That's impressive, Mike. <laughs> oh, I think maybe his power just went back off. <laughs> he's, frozen. he's frozen. I've never seen Mike be so still. <laughs> well, that was a short time with power. He doesn't have that goofy face. You know, they, whenever your picture freezes, like, no. All right, well, wish him the best. I've, uh, I was going to joke with him about Texas having its own power grid and not being connected to the rest of the world. <laughs> oh, he's unfrozen. He's like, oh, there you go. You're back. Good. Perfect. Ready to become yeah, part of the I country and get power from the other states now, Mike? <laughs> <laughs> Man, we're, we're it's, it, this is not fun. <laughs> I've, got, I've got a half of an inch in ice, a foot of snow, and then another half inch of ice on top of that snow. <laughs> but how are you doing with power? I've heard they've actually been taking, uh, like in Dallas, a friend of mine was telling me they're stopping uh, filtering water. What it, are you talking about? Yeah, intermittent. I'm on my own well. So, so you know, what, as long as I get power every once in a blue moon, I'm okay. It'll thaw out the pipes enough to, you know, get the water in. We got tanks of water. So we're, we're going to be okay. We got, I got lots of wood to burn. But my, my neighbors just across the street, right, uh, they're, they got no power. For the last 24 hours. You, you, remember so you live in Texas? Kel Kelvin has, has been without power for a couple of days, Phil. Uh, oh, wow. You just meant you just mentioned frozen pipes. You know, pipes can burst when they freeze, right? That's yeah. a, okay. So, yeah. yeah. I thought yeah, you might absolutely. not know that if, since you're in Texas. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yep. I've got a I've got a building over the pipes that that draw my well in. We try to get the concrete nice and warm in between the power outages. But yeah, if, it, if it's out too long, I'll shut it off at the main tank and, and let it dry out so, so they don't freeze up. As long as it does dry out, um, one thing my, my grandparents used to do was they just would let faucets drip just to make sure there's like some kind of steady flow. Um, yeah. That can help too. Yep. Yeah, you, yeah. You start out with a drip, and then when it goes to minus, you start making it pour, <laughs> or just or just give up and and, and turn it off. You know. Yes, yeah, so this is not not not. We have we haven't broke a pipe yet, or at least not not this this event. But yeah, thanks thanks for the advice, man. It is good advice. Yeah, I've heard the gas lines were actually they were freezing, and I couldn't figure that out because gas freezes like minus one eighty. But apparently the moisture <laughs> in the natural pipes. Moisture uh, in the pipe, yep. Builds yep. up and freezes, and they just don't think it's going to happen in Texas, so they don't really worry about it. Yeah, I was, I, was, I was literally out in the yard about three hours ago with one of these big torch blowers thing, you know, unfreezing one of my gates so I could go chase a chicken down and, and get, get the chicken to go back in the coop. <laughs> so, <laughs> this, is, this is not fun. Okay, since we're talking about chasing chickens, why don't we get to our agenda? <laughs> Seems like a, just as good a segue as any. Um, I want to say Jim, but it's not. It's, I don't. Okay, Jason Hall, uh, the floor is yours. Hey, how's it going? Uh, I'm Jason. I. Uh, know John from Google. I recently left Google and joined Red Hat. Uh, and I had a um, proposal for, maybe I should share my screen like I was planning to share my screen. That'd be smart. Um, uh, yeah, let's do it. You all see that? Okay. Uh, I had a proposal for, um, this is uh, issue 821 for adding a new or two new uh, standard annotations one to specify the digest of the base image 
and one to specify the, a, a human meaningful name of the base image um, at the, uh, yeah, anyway, I'll, I'll, I'll keep going. The name I went with base ref name is because it matches the existing image ref name. I am not at all tied to the names of each, either of these things at all. If anybody has a, a better um, alternative, I'd, I'd love to hear it. The, the basic motivations are sort of in three levels from very simple to a bit more complex to maybe crazy complex. Uh, I don't want to, I want to make it clear I'm not specifying, I don't intend to specify uh, behavior of things. This is literally just to, to reserve these two names of annotations uh, in the spec. Um, the main, the main uh, motivation is to be able to identify images based on specific vulnerable base images. So if I based an image on, you know, my cool OS version six, and then version six turned out to have a terrible uh, vulnerability in it, I would like to be able to scan and find that. Um, vulnerability scanners currently tend to work by identifying identi uh, uh, vulnerable layers and then finding images that specify those layers. Um, I think there are, that works, I think, or, or, or even going further and finding specific files inside of layers. But uh, uh, basing on images is, I think, a slightly better way to handle that. Um, but that's also like the simplest and not uh, uh, the most complex case. Uh, a little bit more is to be able to identify, and that's just using the digest. So, so literally just like my cool image at sha blah, 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 sha bad sha. Um, the second use case is to be able to identify out of date base images. So this is, um, this is where the other, um, the other ref comes in uh, is because I am based on digest sha ABC. Um, but that by itself doesn't give me the information to tell that now uh, my cool OS version six points to SHA, you know, DEF. Uh, and so that's out of date and I can um, use that information to either notify users, hey, you're built on an old thing or show a little badge in, the, in a UI or automatically rebuild if I have source, the source, uh, there's a, an annotation for where the source lives now. Um, Again, I don't intend to specify that things should do this, but with these two pieces of information, they can do this. Uh, and then the third one, which is a bit more leveled up, is um, even aside from, so, so the, the downside of rebuilding automatically is that you need to go find that source and you need to spend compute to rebuild that source. And uh, what if the source isn't there or doesn't build anymore? You know, 1,000 issues with that. Um, we can actually do something in just with registry APIs to rebase the image if we know that that's safe. It's not always going to be safe. It's very often not safe. But if you build your image in such a way, you can uh, cut out the old base image layers, put in new base image layers, and produce an image that is uh, valid and can be you know, rolled out, validated, and rolled out. Um, you can either you can notify, or you can automatically rebuild, or you can automatically rebase. Um, in the wild, there are people doing rebasing uh, at scale. Build packs, for instance, uh, is, is a heavy user of, re of rebasing. Um, I don't know if any of them are here on the call. I talked to a couple of them offline. I don't know if any of them are here. But um, they have an annotation that that is not these two bits of information. It's a lot more information. And it. it's like a, a JSON object inside the annotation value. Um, but it essentially boils down to these two pieces of information. What, what is the digest of the image you were based on? And what new image should I look for for new bases? And if it's out of date, then you can rebuild, or sorry, uh, rebase. BuildText gets away with this because they specify very heavily how the top layers work and how, what they can depend on in the low layers, um, et cetera. There's also a tool that uh, John and I uh, wrote called Crane. And one of the commands in Crane is to rebase. You specify, uh, I can just do the demo. Um, uh, yeah, let's just do the demo because uh, there's other stuff on the agenda and you don't need to keep hearing me talk. Um, so I have this image, um, which is based on Ubuntu 16.04. Um, for the purposes of this demo, let's say that it was based on latest at the time I built it four years ago. And since then, uh, you know, latest has turned into 2004 uh, or whatever. I can run this image, or sorry, uh, what's in there is an entry point with a script that just says cat at CEOS release. Just, so it doesn't depend on anything in the specifics of the base image. Um, so this should be a safe rebase. I can 
use crane rebase to say, take this image, take rebase me, cut out the layers in 1604, replace them with layers in uh, Ubuntu latest, and with that image, push it as uh, rebased. Um, I could do this live if you want. I don't know uh, if you are interested in watching me type forever. But um, in, in Crane, at least, the old base should be specified by digest and shouldn't be the tag. Uh, it's, it supports tag, but it, it probably shouldn't to be safe. If it finds out that original is not actually based on old base, if, if the lower layers of this image don't match the layers in this image, it will fail and say, like, hey, you're wrong. Go fix your life. Um, if original is already based on new base, if, if Ubuntu latest and Ubuntu 16.04 point to the same thing, nothing happens. There's nothing to do. Um, and you can specify the same. You can push to rebase me to tag over it if you want to. I don't know if, if that's interesting. In general, I think people shouldn't do that, but, but nothing stops you. So now after calling this command, this, this only does registry API operations. It doesn't compute anything but digests, really. Um, when you Docker run this image, it will tell you that it's now based on 2004 because it's reading files from the new base image uh, at Etsy OS oh, release. Like I said, uh, none of the none of rebasing is guaranteed to be safe. Uh, uh, don't do this unless you know what you're doing. That is also not part of what I am proposing in the specification of anything. Like this is just to be able to say, um, I can annotate images with these two bits of information that make it uh, uh, standard to say I was based on this at the time I was built, and uh, this is what I should be based on. If it has changed, go do that. Um, so it, it looks, this looks really interesting. Um, it seems like you're wanting to digest so you can do a lookup and follow it to the image. The, the portion of the manifest that is the base. Is that, is that where you're, what the. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So, so yeah. Um, at the time the image was built, Ubuntu latest and Ubuntu at SHA E7, whatever, point to the same thing. Um, but over time, Ubuntu latest will point to something else. Uh, and so. Uh, okay. I want to be able to compare whether it still points to that same thing. And if it doesn't, if I know as a, as a human who built the system, if I know it's safe to rebase, I can, or I can at least rebuild, or I can at least notify that you're based on something else. Um, that, that is also useful to know just for reasons, right? Like the, the vulnerability example. Yeah, you yeah. You know exactly what you built, built from to know if you have this vulnerability. and And... Even if you don't rebase because it's not safe to, you would know that perhaps the Go compiler at that exact version had a bug in it such that the crypto library is vulnerable. And that is very hard to derive if you don't know exactly the base image you were, you were built from. Yeah. I, yeah. Uh, my question was more to the, why did we need a rep name? And he answered that question. <laughs> it, 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 what, why can't we just get it off the image ref name? But I, I see now you want the original base. Right. Uh, yeah. Image. You image want to know they name. pulled it from latest as opposed to a specific image tag. Yeah. But, uh, it, it, as I understand it, the image, uh, regular image ref name already in the spec is what I am called, what my image, like it would be rebase me in this, in this example. Um, and not any information about what I'm based on, what what comes underneath me. Right. But you should be able to get that from the digest. I was trying to figure out why, why you needed both fields and if there was something else missing. Yeah, so so with all, I, I really don't want to over over uh, 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 focus on the rebase case. Uh, the reason, the main reason I wanted to talk about it is uh, it's kind of cool and BuildPex does this in production already. Uh, with their own sort of non-standard purpose built um, uh, annotation. Um, and I'm proposing basically specifying these two new things with these with these semantics. Um, I don't again, I don't think anybody from BuildPex is here, but I talked to them before and they seem largely on board with this and would love to have a spec for it instead of doing their own thing. You will have to take my word for it. Yeah, this sounds good. We haven't isolated in the in the current image spec, you know, anything in the dot base, uh, you know, namespace. But it does make sense that that would be the right place to do it as well, right? Uh, 
org open container space. We should add those, those two in there. Makes sense. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm open to other names if anybody has any. Base was the best thing I could come up with, but um, you know, naming things is hard. Yeah. Um, yeah I mean, you I'll, could do an image base or something. I would point out that like this isn't strictly mathematically a correct concept, right? Like conventionally images tend to have a base um, and it is like a linear legacy. But in theory, I mean, you could have three images and flatten them. And it, uh, th this maps maps pretty well to like what people are doing in real life right now. But you know, the data structures don't necessarily mean that a base image is a thing. Um, so I could see this being like, oh, well, this isn't a perfect uh, perfect abstraction. But I think it's a useful abstraction that everyone, you know, understands what it is and what it would mean. I was trying to, so one I was thinking about the multi-stage builds, um, which is the build pack stuff is interesting because they do a build environment, right? It's, it's, it's not that they're, because we've looked at how do we patch images across all of Azure in critical situations. Um, and there's always these problems of overlays, you know, the things that come in, you, just because you're putting something underneath doesn't mean that somebody put, didn't put the file on top of it. Mm -hmm. uh, that you can't actually resolve. So there's some interesting experiments around and uh, inserting above, which I don't want to get into too much. But the, the point is that the just defining the base is, is interesting, but it is hard to compare with the build packs because their build environment is very tailored to that type of situation. I'm The thing that I tease apart is the, how do I correlate this with some of the SBOM work? Because John mentioned this also, like, you know, what compiler are you version using? And if you're trying to figure out the security vulnerability, it's not just the base image that you're based on, because you might be based on some runtime from Node or Java, but the Node or Java base image that you're dependent on is actually based on Debian or Ubuntu, and it's got its vulnerability. So being able to know that whole tree um, is important. And yeah, that was my next question. <laughs> Does this point to a tree kind of thing? Do we do we need layers here? Yeah. But, uh, so I just I find it interesting. I just I it's I'm worried I'm wondering about how complete it is and how reliable it would be because you can declare what you want as a base, but there's nothing saying you couldn't stick some other value in there when you're really based on something completely different. There's no real verification of it. Right, right. Um, that's a good point. I I don't. I, uh, part of the reason it is not a solution to every possible problem is I wanted to propose the smallest possible change <laughs> uh, in, in the hopes that it would get approved. Um, it, uh, it certainly does point to future work to be able to, you know, if, if many people want to be able to annotate with uh, like, a, like a bill of materials, you know, I information, then, then absolutely that's a direction that you'd want to go. I just don't. Th I, I don't want to. I don't want to jump all the way there. I don't think I. I personally know enough about the state of the art there to know whether that's uh, how to do that. Um, the in, in your in your particular use case, what is it typically just a, a base OS layer that you're looking for? Or? In uh, not always. Um, in a lot of cases, in uh, in build packs, it will be the base OS and some like OS packages or some some other stuff layered on top of a base OS. Mm -hmm. um, I. Uh, but in all cases, it would be some some root image that you're using. Yeah, yeah. That you that you're hoping can be swapped in without breaking the application, something to that effect. Right. And well, in, in, in the rebase case, especially like uh, Rebasing uh, is not safe in 99% of the cases. So, so you need to be really, really careful about how you build, like how you build the upper layers and what they depend on. Ideally, nothing about the lower layers. Um, but again, that's that's one of the three motivations, and the other two are, I think, a bit more straightforward. Just to be able to put a little badge in the registry UI that says, "Hey, if you went and did a build on this again today, it would come up with something different." Like if you know, you said you are from Ubuntu latest. Well, that was four years ago. Ubuntu latest is something else now. Um, I don't know if there's a good way to surface that information. 
I, I, I mean, I, I'm not going to, I was going to start pulling on the threads of the build pack stuff because it's, they, they are very interesting, but because they're highly factored, they can do that model where they're, they're automatically patching like Heroku does and, and even Salesforce with their uh, languages and so forth. But yeah. it, I, I get that that's kind of like an initial benefit, not what you're really focused on. The, the thing that I worry about is just what kind of expectation can be really had from this. I mean, this is, this is like getting into the art of what the vulnerability scanners are really doing. And what does it really, like to, to be able to say it's out of date, okay, that's interesting. To say it's vulnerable, it could be one day old and it might be vulnerable and it could be one year old and it's not, so. Uh, yeah, the, the annotation doesn't say you are vulnerable, right? Like if some, some other tool needs to bring its own information, combine it with this information to tell whether you're vulnerable. Um, uh, Certainly vulnerability scanners can get, they, they can either index by the contents of a layer or the digest of a layer and say, this layer is vulnerable. And you can, you clearly very obviously contain that layer. Um, they can't tell whether some layer on top of it, uh, you know, deleted that file that made it vulnerable or patched, you know, patched a layer on top of it that made it uh, not vulnerable anymore. Right. Um, it, I, is, I, it is I ultimately information. Put, put this on an image manifest so you can, pull the manifest before you pull the image down and have a hint, right? Try to speed things up. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm not sure I understood that one. Well, I, I assume you're gonna put the sanitation in the manifest, in an image manifest? Yeah. yeah. So you could pull that manifest down before you pull the whole image down. Say it was yeah. Do like some <laughs> inspection to decide if you're comfortable with the image kind of thing. Yeah. Right. And it is, uh, uh, I forget who made the point, but it, it is, uh, uh, you are trusting the builder, the, the author of this image that they're sa saying the correct information, right? Like uh, uh, same as with many of the annotations, the source URL annotation I could put in, you know, yahoo.com as my source information that doesn't, nobody stops me. Um, but in order to get the benefits of it, in order to get the benefits of being able to notify you when you're based on a vulnerable image or to automatically rebuild you, you have to give them something that's useful uh, to get something useful out of it. There is a level of trust, though, on the manifest that you receive because it also has its own hash value. So, yeah. yeah. I mean, you could validate that the layers of what it claims to be based on match the lower layers of this image. There are config values that you get flattened that are impossible to you know trace exactly. But I mean, it's a strange thing to lie about. I, I don't know that this is like an attack vector, and, and it could be, but it is mostly informational in the same way that the creation timestamp or the Docker version is informational. Yeah, I guess I'm I'm less worried about, like you said, less worried about malicious attack vectors leaking in through here. There's already basically freeform text field annotations if you wanted to, to do something weird. Um, I think the more likely scenario of this failing is that somebody bases on an image that has this annotation and doesn't update their annotation to say that they're like, that they inherit some other images uh, base annotation without updating it. Uh, and so they're, you know, nominally incorrect or like they, they could have provided more correct information. Um, but I don't think it's, it doesn't strike me as a, a, a tool for, for hackers to do anything mean with. Um, I think it just depends on what expectations are, are set on this, right? It's, I think it's certainly interesting. Like we, we do this kind of information, we track this metadata internally. When somebody builds with ACR tasks, we track what they reference and what the digest is. And, if there's an update, we, we automatically trigger a build if they've asked us to. And we, we also track the other uh, base images in the uh, multi-stage Docker file and they can opt into any of those being tracked. So, I mean, it's I, I don't want to squash the ideas of you know, like, hey, let's get some innovations going and see what can build on it. I'm just wondering what what is the expectation of these values because it, it could be an attack vector, like many things could be, to be fair, like to, in, even an SBOM, because if you've put this in the manifest, then you built the image. If somebody builds an SBOM with, an, with their image, they put the SBOM in there and it, it, all we can do is sign it and say, yep, it came from that authority. And as long as that authority's key is still valid, they could also lie, right? It, so there's nothing, it's, it's always that 
that secondary check. You go to the airport, they look at your passport, you know, they scan it to see if it was, re, re, um, you know, on your block list, but they're not going to ask you to prove should, how did you get this passport. So it's, you can kind of do the same thing here and say, look, this is some annotations of information that's helpful. Um, there's no guarantee this digest actually matches, and, but it's, it's interesting information. Yeah, and to John's point, if the digest doesn't match, it's, it's very quick to be able to verify that. You, you, you pull the manifest of the thing at the digest, you said it is, you compare the layers. If the layers aren't right, then you're wrong. Uh, and any tooling that would automatic or do anything automatically based on this would be able to say like, well, I don't know what to do now. Uh, next time, don't lie. Um, yeah. Hmm. I'm mute. I think you're muted. Wrong way. And I even, uh, Zoom was even helpful to say that I hear, hear you doing something, you're muted. Um, the digest is certainly unique. It doesn't mean that the registry I'm currently in has that digest. And the ref name is, you know, what are you proposing the values are there? So if I'm in my private registry, because I moved my content to the private registry, but I did a build from Ubuntu, you know, directly from Docker Hub or from another registry where I keep my base artifacts. Where is the ref name, the fully qualified name that your from statement had? Is that what you're proposing here? Um, oh, that uh, work. Uh, I, think, I think there may have been two questions in there and I can try to answer both. One is if I said, if my Docker file said from Ubuntu new line, uh, does that mean that base ref name is Ubuntu end of string or docker uh, index.docker.io slash ubuntu colon latest um i don't you, you missed the library part of that <laughs> damn it john I, so I, I wasn't trying to tease out the expanse the automatic expansion and the default goo that goes in there. Yeah. so yes we should have that minor detail but my question was more yeah. of is it just say ubuntu meaning we're assuming it came from Docker, but we can expand it to Docker IO library, as John was pointing out. Or are we saying it's just um, uh, Ubuntu, and I might have actually been pulling a from statement from my private registry. So what I'm getting at is, I'm, I'm actually somewhat suggesting that the ref name actually is the fully qualified from statement wherever it is. So if it's from Docker Hub, yes, it should say Docker IO library. If it's a Ubuntu that's copied to my private registry where my team builds from, then it should say, you know, you know Acme Rockets dot, you know, registry dot Acme Rockets dot Ubuntu, uh, dash Ubuntu or whatever. Um, you know where I'm going with it. In other words, it should be the fully qualified. So I can run that again, or I can actually query that registry, compare that digest and know if it's good. I might not have access to the registry, but at least you've got the two pieces that you could rebuild from, uh, rebuild it over again. Right, I think, I think it is, um, I think with, these annotations and and uh, I think all of the annotations, they're only as valuable as the information you, you or some tool puts into them for you. Uh, if it if the build tool tries to do something smart and puts in the uh, private registry version, but it's inaccessible to anything, then I'm sorry, we're not going to be able to help you. Like like the digest is is still able to tell you that it's out of date, maybe or 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 something, or that it's vulnerable. Um, but if uh, if tools put if, if tools try to do smart things and put in values that make it impossible to do good things, then then I don't think I don't think we can stop them. But I think we should try to try to convince them not to. Uh, to your question, I think I would want it to be. I think I would want it to be the value of the from statement. Uh, I don't have a strong opinion whether it's. Uh, library.docker.io. John's going to cringe when he hears that. But uh, um, uh, whether it's the fully expanded version, I don't, uh, I'm fine with whatever you, you all think. I, I, I think if it is semantically the location with, from which it was pulled, it is most useful because digest tells you what it is and the ref tells you where it's from. Uh, originally, and so with those two pieces of information, you you can do whatever you want. You can go look up if the tags moved. You know, it it's the most useful thing. I don't think it's very useful to be like, oh, this was the tag of 
and then not have the repository, right? You, you want to know yeah. how to get it. And you may not have access to it, but that's okay. The point is yeah, that- Yeah, that, that, that sort of presumes that, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, if you could have built this in the past, presumably you can build this now right. or or something has changed and which that's good to know, right? You can't actually rebuild this image. That's frightening. <laughs> Right, yeah, that's that's also like useful a useful signal to surface to people. Like Ubuntu is no longer there. If Ubuntu got deleted, like, hey, you can no longer build this image. Maybe reconsider. And that by itself says it's out of date. Yeah, well, it's like another. It might be up to. There might not be a newer version of Ubuntu. There might not be any newer versions of it because it's gone. Or I pulled from some private registry that turns out to be bad. Bad guy. Registry. Yeah. So, yeah. And that's, you know, but anyway, I, 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 kind of, I guess I came around full circle on it. It's, it's like it overlaps with some of the SBOM stuff, but we don't know when that's going to fully land. And it's a much more complicated environment. This does has have some interesting information that people can leverage. I think if, if we're going to define it in the open containers namespace, then I think we just have to finish up exactly what we're saying those two properties should, should have when they're used. Um, of course, people can stick their phone number in there if they want, but it's the point is what what should, to be to honor the name. What should that definition be? Yeah, uh, in that case, since it sounds like people are generally in agreement, I'm going to stop uh, before I convince anybody not to agree with me. And uh, I think is the next step to file a PR where this gets added to the annotations, and we can we can argue over exact wording and and bike shed colors. Blue, blue bike shed forever. All right. Gosh, you guys just did the distribution spec rewrite of the, the spec, right? Not the image spec. Actually, wait, where are these annotations specified? This is image spec. This is yeah. image. Yeah. Yeah, this, this shouldn't affect that at all. Yeah, it would live alongside like these ones. Yeah, I would. I would at this point, propose a PR. Okay. Take it from there. Uh, all right, great. Uh, thank you very much. This has been a great uh, conversation. I will now cede the floor to the other topic. I saw that there was another topic. So thank you all very much. Yep. Thanks. Thanks. Cool. Double link pointers. All right. <laughs> I love it. Oh, is that double what? Well, it's a, it's a backlink. So we have a, we have a, we have a double link list now. Oh, <laughs> sort of. We'll, we'll see. Um, let's see. The other one was reviving Vincent's extension conversation. Did Vincent make the call? I saw he th threw some eyes, and I think it was Tinan said, put some glasses on it as well. But I don't see Vincent here. Um, so we'll just continue. Have, have people put more thought to this since this was proposed? Because this is. Get my Zoom thing going here. I, I thought we were going with it, and then Vincent said something about he was backing off, and then I'm not sure what happened. Do you, I don't remember the state. I, re, I really liked it. The thing I was trying to wrestle with was um, okay, my, my, uh, was this discovery API, like what the value of a discovery API would be versus the API is either there or not, right? Because it's interesting to be able to ask a registry, do you support these extensions? But just because it says yes or no, doesn't mean they didn't implement the API right or wrong. So like in the notary client, when it goes and asks for what, you know, what signatures apply to the hello world image, it's just gonna make the API call. It's got no reason to go, That's hey, do you support this API? Just say, hey, API, give me the results. And when the thing says, don't know what that API is, clearly the registry doesn't support that capability. I see. So um, each, each extension should have some level of specification around it, explaining what the APIs are, what the context is, that sort of thing. Yeah, that, that makes sense. Otherwise, it's just an experimental extension. And I think he was talking about having, you know, one layer set of layers that were more, you know, more specific, more defined than others. And others would be just, you know, a simple extension. I'm, I'm doing a work in progress test, right, kind of thing. I'd, I'd worry about feature detection. So we have to be very careful about the semantics of new APIs because 
old registries don't know about them. And so if, if say, like you define a 404 as a reasonable response to some request that indicates something useful, like, oh, this link doesn't exist or this has no links, um, you have to under, like, that may be what the intended response is from the registry, but the registry also might just be returning a 404 because it doesn't support that. And if you say, oh, return a 501 if you don't support that, well, we, we're not going to be able to change every registry that, to return a 501. So um, I think this is useful beyond uh, feature detection for that reason, but I generally agree that it, it's nicer to, you know, just try to use the API and if it works, it works whether or not. So from a, like we would, I, I like to, there's a separate conversation we're having around the discovery APIs, but I figured this is a good way to test this model because um, there's so much wrapped into the artifact manifest conversation and the reverse link API conversation. Regardless, like what I would love to see, I'd love to see it in distribution, right? Like I just love to be able to know that all distribution, whether or not they support them, just like catalog management or the other things we've said that not all registries have to support from a conformance point of view. Um, there's an interesting set of questions of what extensions are clearly extensions that are unique maybe to a specific registry um, or to a specific company, right? A company might plug in something that only that, you know, Acme Rockets would use. But then there's a set of features that I just, I think, we agree we'd like to add and we just we have to figure out how to agree on what what we'll add um so rather than one way i was thinking about doing it rather than just have this debate whether it belongs in distribution or not is let's experiment with it in the artifacts approach because we're, we're trying to use that to enable notary so and then if we think it's well adopted then maybe we could promote it to distribution um, so whether or not it stays in artifacts or not is a good question, but at least it helps us test this extension API was kind of the, the thought process. And then the detail that I had there is I couldn't tell from this whether we're saying we want to do underscore extension in the root of v2 so that we can you know, do something where it's you know, the OC artifacts is the, the extension name. And then we're just following the standard namespace repo path. Or we're saying we actually want the extension API to list in certain elements of that path. Um, this one makes me more nervous. We're already yeah. doing this. I, for was, I believe it was the former. We'd have to get Vince in. We should probably ping him and have a call specifically with Vince, see where he's at. Justin there. started responding. He, he had a reaction to this as well at first um, at the end of the call. So. Like obviously we want to we'll get more eyes on than just this call, but I figured here's a place for good conversation. Um, the this comment is a bit we I don't think the proposal is that you have the entire API path after the extension, but like a hard coded identifier for a feature, like one or two, like a PEP. Right? We'd have like an OCI enhancement proposal. And if you implement OEP number three then this would somehow be served that way. Not like you just try the API. Does that make sense? Well, I, I read that. And I couldn't tell if that was just examples rather than trying to come up with funky names. But like I, I don't know the benefit of saying OEP 1, 2, and 3 and making sure those got registered. Yeah, yeah the benefit is you can have a small bit list of the features that you support or don't support in one response value. You know, one U long or something to respond back saying. For this number of bits, these are the ones I support or not. I think, I think we should make it in such a way that a registry provider can come up with endpoints that no one's ever going to adopt and still let clients use them, um, like a plugin model for registries. I, I just I wish that there was. Uh, I don't know, Steve, your name is CNCF Distribution. Can we oh, add a plugin sorry. system to <laughs> to that project? And um, This happens all the time. Leave him alone. <laughs> no. I was um, going to ask Phil, how does he keep on switching it? So hold on. But I just, I, I don't know. I just, I see this pattern of, uh, you know, people come up with proposing, like, for example, the manifest list we were talking about last week. Um, instead of like opening 
kind of just these open-ended discussions that go on for months and years. It'd be cool uh, if we could play with them uh, while they're staged in a certain company's um, repo in some way. Right, uh, yeah, that was exactly what he was looking for was you know the hope that we could add an extension so that it wouldn't break anybody and you, people could start testing it, right? Yeah, I guess uh, what I'm what I'm saying is I don't I don't know that it needs to like be accepted in the distribution spec as a as a pep or something like that. I think like you know Steve's team can just say this is our this is the Microsoft way and hopefully people like it and eventually that could get merged into distribution if enough if it kind of catches on, but. Um, I don't know, and I, I, John, we were, there was some discussion about this uh, last week, like, is there some way for us to test these things out? Is there some server implementation that could provide a way to like play around with some new features, but. Yeah, this, this comes up a lot. I mean, like I probably am not going to roll out an experiment to prod GCR to get y'all to test it. Um, so having like a playground sandbox implementation that is less complicated than distribution is nice. I have one that is in a repro I happen to own. Uh, I, that's what I'm planning to use to prototype stuff that I proposed, uh, but I don't know that it's a great idea to like, make this the canonical implementation because it's mostly used for unit tests. Um, but if it, if we can agree on like what the contract is with this plugin system or extension system, then that might be the perfect thing. Cause it's like, I don't want to call your code throwaway code, but like for people to play around. Um, but I don't know. I don't, I don't really know what I'm talking about here. So no, no it's a, you're making a good point. I mean, it's a, it's a, it would be nice if there was an easier way to experiment with this stuff. And I agree. And I, if someone wants to fork it and use that in conversations, we can, you know, it, it's a useful tool. I don't know that it, like, I want it to be an official thing, but as a pattern, like forking this in memory implementation is totally reasonable. I'm trying to follow what, are we just talking about how somebody would test this with a, their own registry or we're talking about like, how do I, is like, this the, should the name be OEP one, two, three, four, five, or can it be a string? All right, so let's use manifest lists as an example. Um, and I'll just, I'll, I'll use Zot uh, as an example project, just because I think Zot is relatively new code base that um, compared to like distribution, which a PR might take uh, like two years to get in. Um, like if you could somehow start the server and point to a directory uh, of binaries that expand the capabilities of the server. Um, I'm trying to think, there's a there's an interesting, there's a project, uh, there's a VMware project called Octant that has an interesting plugin model. Um, and if I'm getting like two in the weeds on this, let me know, but uh, it has an interesting plugin model where you basically, um, it's like a Kubernetes dashboard system, but you, you install plugins by putting things in a certain path. And then when you start the server, it just, it discovers that they're there. And all of a sudden you get different endpoints in the UI um, or capabilities that you wouldn't have otherwise. And then to remove the capability, you just remove that binary. And there's like a contract between, um, I'm overusing the word contract, but there's like a contract between the way the binary interacts or the plugin binary interacts with the octant binary and you can only do so many things. So kind of like uh, advanced version of Swagger, like if we could say expose like certain endpoints in a way that, um, I don't know, it's not fully fleshed. I, I just, I, I feel like there's something cool we can do um, that would, uh, that would, prevent these like lengthy GitHub discussions and just be like, look, just download Zot and install my plugin. And it's, there you go. Um, I'm trying to figure out what problem we're solving there. Cause like in smaller, you want to say smaller cause in size, 
in, in private registries, uh, in, in standalone registries, whether it be Harbor running on-prem or even if you're running Harbor in a cloud, when somebody's running that registry themselves, they might want to put you know, whatever they want in it and having this auto expansion that figures out what URL to put in is fine. I, from a security perspective, I can't think of any of the cloud registries that'd be willing to run arbitrary customer code. Like that, that's like the most scary thing possible. So like each one of us will say, we want to support a certain extension. Um, if somebody's written source that we might use, then we will of course evaluate it and look at it. And if we're comfortable, we'll, we'll deploy it. Um, what we're trying to solve here is what namespace should extensions, should I, if I have an, a, an API that I want to be generally useful, it may not be in distribution and it, it's more useful than just ACR. Like ACR, we have a bunch of ACR slash extensions that we have for actually for our discovery APIs and other things that we, we do that aren't in distribution. So if I want to run a registry and I want to add support for a project, say artifacts, how do I, what is the expectation for that team to register their URLs at? Yeah, I'm, I'm not really proposing a production ready solution. I'm, I think the, the underscore EXT is solves what you're asking about. And yes, if we can, if we can come up with the URL scheme is for these extensions or plugins, and then, you know, whichever project wants to provide what I'm describing, just for as a playground experiment, um, they would expose those endpoints under the underscore EXT and, you know, ACR might in a production way implement that in the best way possible. But um, I'm just, I'm, I'm kind of like coming at it from the, like, let's play around with some stuff for fun at, yeah. uh, angle and not like I have customers angle. I, I, I think I agree. Like I'm happy to debate with Steve intensely on PRs about things abstractly, but it's it's useful to, I think, have an implementation to play with so people can say, oh yeah, this works for my use case. I wrote a client and it it does this. Versus like, I'll I will literally talk about software until I fall asleep abstractly, and that's not particularly useful. Yes, and I and I have fallen asleep with some of these discussions. So, I don't know. Maybe I'll. Uh, I think. I've inspired myself to do some things. So to be continued. Okay, so obviously we wanna get Vincent um, on this because it was his original idea. So I, I, I think there was also a, a note that there was no reservation of underscore EXT even mentioned in the spec. So that's another thing in addition to underscore catalog, we should probably note as a reserve space. So if if folks are fine with the understore DXT, and I'll ping Vincent and Justin Cormack uh, just for two that I know that reference that had conversations about this, and and if John, I think you were the other one that was active on this, um, and Derek, if everybody's good with the understore EXT, then I'd like to start moving forward with that. So I just, but I don't want to move forward in a in a place that people are surprised. I think that's fine. I'd I'd like to see you know, just some, a workflow proposed of how we do this stuff. Yeah. Um, Meaning I, how somebody yeah. would submit a, or say that they're declaring an extension at a certain reserve space. Right. I, I think that like having something like a cap is a good identifier and maybe that lives in a repo. Uh, um, but yeah, I mean. It, that was one of the processes we talked about just using cap numbers. I think abstractly is a, is a good idea and everyone wants to do this, but nobody wants to like be the first person to make all the mistakes. Uh, and so I'd, I'd like it. I just want to know like what I need to do, I guess. I guess part of it, I'm, I'm challenging. Do we really need to do the, the cap thing or just put names in that are meaningful so that I can say like there is a, this PR had um, a simple table that people could, you know, put PR, you know, put their, submit their name going, hey, yep, I'm trying to put this extension in. So OCI dash artifacts and then a quick, just quick link to maybe the spec. Yeah, that's fine. We just need the a... next person coming in would say, whoop, I can't use that name. Let me use another name. 
right. And, and, yeah. you just, and you just found the reason, right? Because you, you're basically having a catalog of the extensions right there. You know, what's the table? And yeah, you could use alphanumeric. I think for he wanted to use numbers. We could, we could ask Vince why, but I believe it was so you could have, you know, just a, a, a small little, these are the ones we support, yes or no, kind of, kind of thing. You know, use feature gates like John was talking about, right? Like using the cap process. But yeah, you can do it alphanumerically. That, it doesn't really matter if it's numerical or alpha. Okay. All right, with seven minutes, I won't try to open another topic. So um, we'll go down that. Good deal. All right, uh, same bat time, same bat channel for next week. Thanks, folks. See you.